commonly used security analytics. The most common would be a virtual line where you draw in a line and if any object is crossing you get a notification now this particular line that you draw you have the option to mark a direction you can say from left to right if someone is crossing i need an alarm or if someone is entering your property from outdoor or entering your property from the perimeter to your property inside in that case you need an alarm so you can customize the direction of motion which should trigger the alarm so here in this case there is a line drawn and the direction is from left to right if the car is entering or crossing that particular line i need an alarm okay then you could also have area detection which is you mark a box uh, over a sensitive area it could be um, storage let's say you're storing a valuable item or it could be a parking lot or it could be uh, uh, it could be a certain uh, hazardous area or or simply the entire uh, property uh, you can mark then how you configure is you can say after the night time after 6 p.m if anyone enters the zone so if have if you have this box it's called enter or exit detection that means if anyone crosses the box then it detects if someone is still outside it doesn't matter if someone is already inside it does not matter but if the box perimeter of the box is being crossed if someone uh, cuts the line then it triggers an alarm okay so that is enter detection or exit uh, as long as the object is inside the box, it is fine in exit detection. But if the object leaves the box, then you can get an alarm. It's called exit detection. Okay. Some people call it uh, stopped vehicle detection or uh, or uh, exit detection would be, uh, let's say, in the example in the night time, if you're, uh, if uh, let's say the cars are parked, it's a parking lot, and you can see, if you see some cars are leaving from your property or from offices, and you want to get a notification after working hours or from the valet parking area, it could be different scenarios that the operator can think of, you can get an alarm. Okay, so here we go. Just a small graphic, which shows the car has left, and it triggers the alarm. Then tamper detection. Tamper detection is if you block the camera view, you mask the camera view with the spray paint or with a cloth, or you move the camera physically, it triggers an alarm. And uh, this is a serious issue because someone is actually tampering with the security device. So it can also trigger an alarm. Previously in the history, people used to use a tamper switch which required someone to open the camera box and then it triggers the alarm. But today, this is software-based analytics. They are already embedded inside the camera. So you don't have to have a separate wiring for this activation. It is all sent over the, um, over the you can say, over the software command, the VMS or any uh, NVR will receive this event. Okay. Face detection is simple. Uh, it's an advanced way of motion detection. Motion detection means if there is any motion in the scene, it triggers an alarm. Face detection means that motion has to be um, supported by some characteristics. They call it heuristics. You need to, um, it should look for an eye, nose, and mouth. It, it looks for those lines in the pixels which resembles a face and then it triggers an alarm. So that is face detection. Okay. Then audio detection. Audio detection is not typically video analytics. It's related to audio, but there are cases where some customers have requested for it. 
the cameras, some of them have built-in microphone and majority of them, you have the option to connect an external microphone. Now, through the microphone, the camera can pick up the sound and if the sound exceeds a certain value, decibels, and it matches certain conditions, it could be glass breaking sound, the frequency pattern uh, would be initially high pitch and then low. So if it matches certain frequency levels, it can tell you there is a glass breaking sound or a gunshot or an explosion sound or simply um, sound detected, a uh, very high volume of sound detected. It could be someone screaming or someone breaking into the shop with a glass, uh, because there's a glass in the shop. So it could be that uh, windows are broken. So that could be one gunshot that it can detect that sound pattern also. So uh, what is the benefit of audio analytics is the camera may be looking in some random direction somewhere else, but the sound can come from behind the camera. It can still detect that analytics. Okay. Whereas in video analytics, the camera should be looking at the scene, only then it will trigger the alarm. Okay. Then there is another type of analytic called loitering. Loitering refers to a person just wandering in an area without any um, clear definition or purpose. It could be, um, I mean, uh, some of you may not fully understand this because, uh, for example, in Dubai, we don't see much of this cases, so it's not a common occurrence. And uh, let's say you have a government a ministry building, okay? And if someone is taking photographs around that area, it's a suspect. There is some unwanted behavior, right? So or let's say in a hotel lobby or corridors, if someone is just walking around the corridor for more than five minutes, usually when you're in a hotel, you directly take the lift and you go to your room, that's it. You don't wander around in the corridors, right? So that behavior is loitering. So you are intending to do something, you're premeditating a crime. So it could, it could be considered as a, an, unwanted behavior. So the camera can pick it up, can see, okay, this guy is roaming around for so long and around this area, trigger an alarm. If you have gone to any uh, prime properties, let's say if you go to uh, or a prime property control room, the control room guys are always monitoring for people who are uh, loitering, okay? Uh, I have come across a situation where they send a notice saying, this person is standing here for more than five minutes. Please check if he needs something, if he needs some help, uh, or just to check on him. What is his purpose? Why is he here? Okay. All right, next is handover. Handover is a feature where a camera can send a command to another camera. Handover is a feature where camera one can send a command to another camera. Why is this required? This is explained with a, with a video would be better. Let me see, here we go. Okay. Now on the right side, this is a fixed camera. The person is walking through, okay? On the left side, there is a PTZ, Pantel Zoom camera, which is monitoring the car park. Now, when someone enters a certain zone, the fixed camera sends a command to the Pantel Zoom camera. I, this is something we will have to cover today as well. Uh, and then what happens? it asks the Pantel zoom camera to start zooming in in that area and track. Okay, another example. Um, let me see. 
hand over <coughs> Okay, so this is another example. On the left side, there is a camera with a wide area monitoring. And on the right side, I have a zoom camera which can move left, right, up and down. So now it changed the position to the area where the person is walking in the stadium. So how did it do? On the left side, the camera is having a wide area monitoring, right? So what I do is I mark zones. Uh, in this area. I mark maybe eight zones and every zone, if it detects a certain motion, it will send a command to the pan -tilt zoom camera to go to that location. So here the person is walking in the uh, through the stairs and the stadium, the cam, cam this camera sends a command to a PTZ camera to come here. Okay, it's a good question. Can it do if it, there is a crowd and all that? Uh, the idea of this is for uh, when you have an area, for example, the stadium is closed and if someone is walking in, you want to get a notification. Okay, this is one. There has been another example one customer has asked. Um, they want to track the, let's say a huge boat that is crossing the crossing under the bridge. Now the uh, boat or ship, so it can come in different location, right? It can, uh, so it can come here. It can, let me change the color. Right. So let's say out of this 100 meters, the ship can cross in this area, this area, or this area. Different scenarios are possible. Now they won't automatically the PTZ to go here if the ship is coming or crossing under the bridge in this location to monitor if there are any accidents that are going to happen because it's uh, every time the ship comes, they have to open the bridge. So the PTZ will go here. If someone is, if the ship comes in this location, the PTZ will go here. So this kind of behavior is not, a, it's if it is happening on a regular basis as a crowd, then it's not the right to, uh, application or it could be a perimeter let's say you have one fixed camera monitoring 100 meters okay 100 meters now a person walks at the 50th meter and you want the ptc camera to go in this area then it is okay because you're not expecting somebody and there is a person walking in okay now this um, the first fixed camera this guy it can be any type it can be a standard camera thermal camera any type of camera, it's okay, but fix it camera, it will send a command to a PTZ. Okay, another point, um, it will track the first person that it sees, even if someone else is crossing the person, it will continue to track the first person. Okay, so that is how it works. So the handover setting is done camera to camera and it does not depend on a VMS or NVR, so you don't have to uh, depend on a third party software to do this. It is directly commanded between camera to camera. Now, if you look at different types of analytics, the uh, it is somewhat common across all the vendors, but the names will change, appear, disappear, appear, disappear. So if someone dropped a bag, a new foreign object is left. Someone, let's say in a, typically this is the example that people take, airport, someone left a bag. The camera can pick it up and say there is an object left behind for more than five minutes and it will trigger an alarm, appear analytics. Okay, some call it, uh, abandoned object okay uh, for, it could also be a car a car parked in an area for a long time that could be co considered as an appear analytic uh, disappear someone removed an object so the initially the camera will learn the scene what's in the scene if any object is removed it will trigger an alarm object missing so the word for analytics 
it changes from brand to brand vendor to vendor because they are patented okay and there is a licensing involved uh, so if we develop our own analytics we don't have to pay any license so if uh, so if some vendors uh, they don't develop analytics. Some CCTV companies, they don't develop it. They take it from a third party and they pay royalty fees, uh, maybe $2, $3 per camera. Okay. For us, we develop and we have our own names. Uh, so uh, we don't have to pay to someone and we keep developing it. Usually when, some, when it is uh, outsourced, there's no development that ever happens. Uh, will just be there for the last 10 years the algorithm is still the same very rarely they develop and i've personally experienced it okay so next is loitering it comes under a behavior analytic next is detection detection means yeah you know so yesterday or the first day we saw detection motion detection so it detected a motion in the scene face detection it detected a face it's not recognition okay remember the word recognition means i know ahmed and this is ahmed that is recognition detection means somebody is there that is detection okay tamper detection someone is tampering shock detection shock there is uh, these not all cameras have shock detection and you don't need it in the first place generally uh, it's only for uh, let's say uh, if you're uh, let's say if the area let the camera pole or the wall where the camera is installed if there is a lot of vibration someone's trying to damage or someone is trying to uh, hit the camera so the camera can sense the vibration and trigger the alarm so that there is a gyro sensor, G-Y-R-O, gyro sensor. It can detect frequency, vibration frequencies of 15 hertz and detect and say, okay, there is some kind of vibration in the scene and trigger an alarm, okay? And uh, next is fog detection. Fog, dust, sandstorm, all comes under the same category. If the camera view is uh, completely masked and it cannot visibly produce, produce a clear image, it will trigger an alarm and say there is a fog detected. So if that particular area is a sensitive area, you can manually send somebody to check that area. Some cameras also have defog analytics, okay, uh, defog correction. So they increase the contrast settings and try to make the image slightly better. Uh, there is called software-based uh, defog. Uh, it's not very great, but there is one more function called optical defog. This is something you can keep a note of. Optical defog. Optical defog, it only works in black and white mode when you turn it on. Um, optical defog looks for IR wavelength. You remember the infrared, it looks for IR wavelength. Uh, IR wavelength, they have longer wavelengths, so it can pass through the water droplets and somehow reach the camera compared to visible light. Visible light gets disturbed a lot with the water droplets in the air, but IR can pass through. So you can see here, the same camera without optical defog, you cannot see that small boat with optical defog it's much clearer so this technology is available today in the cameras all right next is uh, defocus defocus detection this uh, camera sensors and lens uh, the focus can eventually degrade due to temperature change when the temperature is high it things expand when the temperature is low things compress so the focus point can also slightly change up or down so most cameras have auto de auto focus correction so this is usually not a problem passing analytic virtual line you draw a line if a car crosses that line then it triggers an alarm so let me um, second okay the uh, word for uh, crossing line crossing there are other words virtual line detection directional motion detection why is it called directional detection it could be this way 
let's say the car is supposed to go in a highway in, a, in one particular direction but if a car is going the opposite direction you can get an alarm okay so uh, that could be uh, that could be used as well second directional Next is enter exit. Enter exit also we have seen. Um, you draw a box and in the box, if someone enters, it triggers an alarm. If someone leaves the box, it triggers an alarm. The scenario you can decide how it should be based on your application. In the data center, after working hours, if someone enters, I need an alarm. Okay. Or, uh, or let's say, uh, could be exit, exit alarm. Exit alarm could be um, usually if someone leaves a property after a certain hour or uh, if it is an unmanned area, you can keep uh, this exit alarm if someone leaves that particular zone. Okay, now uh, let's see, okay. Next is sound analytics. Sound analytics, we saw break glass, screaming, sudden spike in the sound. Uh, all this comes under sound category. Next is business related. Business related is uh, apart from security, you can count the number of people walking in the property. Uh, you can detect if there is a lot of people in the queue. If it increases over 10 people, the queue length is very long. So camera will pick it up and say the queue length is high. So uh, trigger an operator, uh, trigger a command to the retail manager to send some people to take care of the crowd. Okay, heat map, heat map simply tells you which area of the shop, which area of your property is having a lot of uh, gathering. Okay, uh, some of you may have seen in, uh, in LinkedIn, there is another vendor which posted how they used heat map to track a crime. So they had this camera on the uh, on the uh, on the residential properties, uh, but eventually they noticed one of the area is always is a hot spot. Okay, due to heat map detection, uh, one area, you know, one hidden area, or you can say one particular zone, uh, people were taking that route a lot. A lot of people were walking to that area. So they understood it could be a cause for some kind of drug activity. And it was true that a lot of people were going to that particular section in that residential property um, may, because they wanted to buy drugs. So this is something they can use. If it is business related, uh, they can understand, okay, how the people are moving in the mall. There was a customer from uh, Kenya who said, um, yeah, so, okay. So there was a shopping mall and next to that there was a railway. So people used to take the escalators through the shopping mall to reach the railway station. Okay, then uh, uh, they, uh, they wanted to monetize this particular, uh, you know, traffic. People walking every morning, they use the escalator in the shopping mall to reach the railway. So what they did, uh, you, with simple heat map, they understood that none of them were uh, going inside the mall. They were just taking, as soon as they enter the mall, take the escalator uh, and uh, go towards the direction of the metro station. So uh, what they did is they changed uh, the direction of the escalator, which allows them to walk to the food court area and then come out. So they have every time in the morning, the person has to enter the mall, walk all the way inside through the food court and then come out and take the escalator. So they made the walking pattern in such a way that all the food courts benefited from uh, selling breakfast in the morning. So they were able to uh, monetize that particular traffic, people traffic. 
all right now benefit of analytics when camera detects all of these they send some data okay when it detected a motion it will send some small data which is uh, text uh, relate it's a very small data you don't think it's going to send big huge amounts of gigabyte no it tells the uh, it saves the location where motion occur okay for example in this particular scene a uh, lot of people walking right generally a lot of people walking but what the camera does wherever the people are walking so there is a guy walking here there is some uh, group of people walking there there will be a lot of people crossing the streets so it keeps a track where the motion occurred okay where the event occurred so this is called metadata data about data is called metadata so what is the data about data uh, data of motion where the motion occurred in the scene it keeps a record that is called metadata so when an incident occurred you can identify and say who's the first person who entered this area who's the last person who entered this area you can use the analytics to do this work okay so let's see So I, I want to figure out how many people used that particular uh, gate, okay? So I put enter detection. Let me play the video. So I draw a box and I put enter, show me all the people who entered that area. When I click search, it will filter out all the incidents that occurred in this gate from the time I chose. So let's say I chose from five o'clock onwards and it tells me exactly when all people walked. So you see there was a group at 544 who walked in. It could be for your data center. It could be for your property. Who was the first person to enter today? Who was the last person to leave today? Okay. Who was the person at the time of the incident? So helps you to quickly investigate all of these features and you don't need a any basic camera can do this as long as it supports metadata so for us we don't every camera from every series is able to do this and this is possible because of metadata okay you don't need ai artificial intelligence all that this is part of a basic requirement next okay people counting this is fine it gives you uh, there are intelligence uh, business intelligence applications available which tells you each shop how many people visited total how many people visited heat map which area is more crowded queue management which um, just detect the number of uh, people and tells you okay this queue uh, at, usually at this time it is having a very high peak so it can you can take actions accordingly All right, and today's uh, one of the core topics would be artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. OK. OK, I have some question whether people counting can be done as part of the same uh, VMS. Uh, people counting is done in the camera. The same camera is used for security, but um, the counting if you have too many cameras, we uh, recommend to use a uh, application. We call it business intelligence application, which will collect all the data from all the cameras. There is one more method directly from the camera. You can download the counting report. That is one. So there are two ways to do it. Um, in the VMS, if you want to pull the data of counting, uh, some of them can do it. But generally, we have a separate application like this. We call it business intelligence. You can get the aggregated data from uh, if you have five entrances, all the five entrances, it will count together and send your total total 30,000 people over a period of uh, so many days. Um, if you have. 
multiple shops you can see multiple shops in the similar fashion do you have any specific website for heat maps and such website okay okay i did not get the part about website uh, we have cameras with built-in heat map application um, and the second point is how to see the heat map we have the business intelligence software which shows you um, from each shop at which point let's say at five o'clock which area was most crowded four o'clock which area is most crowded overall throughout the day which area was most crowded so that kind of data we can get okay. on the camera there is a web page to configure and download the report next is artificial intelligence ai ai word was coined many many years back but today it has become very popular the uh, the word ai today has become extremely popular purely because of accuracy and the cost of implementing it okay artificial intelligence requires um, a lot of processing okay just like how mobile phones evolved initially mobile phones was typically used for making calls sms but today you can do um, many applications you can run high-end gaming you can run your office applications so on okay uh, same way in the camera initially the camera processes back then was not very highly um, did not was not okay uh, was not powerful enough but today in the camera itself the same processor or uh, you can say this in the camera the processor now you can achieve artificial intelligence okay simply put there is it has become more cost effective today okay done next is under artificial intelligence there are two ways of uh, training the camera okay now what first what is the meaning of artificial intelligence if any computer or a machine behaves like a human being and uh, reason and learn that is artificially intelligent okay now how to train that computer or machine machine learning okay uh, now in cctv uh, there are two ways to train the camera okay in cctv uh, systems the camera is the object uh, or the computer that is going to be trained okay there are two ways of training the camera okay uh, take it as it is because uh, some of you may say yeah machine learning deep learning but i'm just going to give you a basic difference machine learning and deep learning okay uh, in cctv there are two ways but deep learning is the most efficient and i will tell you how and why and let's understand what is machine learning and how it is done okay take an example this is my favorite example that i usually take to make the subject clear in a machine learning let's say i want to train a camera to detect animal and tell whether the animal is a cat or a dog i want to train a camera and ask the camera to detect and tell me if it is a cat or a dog okay now as a programmer i can program the camera by writing a code and in the code i can mention and say please look for pointed ears and if you see pointed ears consider it as a cat so based on my learning based on the information that i gave to the camera the camera makes informed decisions saying okay now i see an animal and the ears are pointed so it's a cat if the ears are not pointed drooping it's a dog so how did the camera decide this based on the information i gave okay that is simply called machine learning okay making informed decisions now the challenge is what if the cat has folded ears okay now as a programmer i have to go back and correct the system 
I have to re-enter another line of code and specify uh, first look for pointed years. Then if not, please also check for other characteristics. Look for the hair around the nose whiskers or look for the way the cat is walking or look for the body hair type or look for the size of the cat. I have to keep on entering so many conditions. Got it? Now, as a programmer, does he know how cats are? Does he know the anatomy or the or the or the the, uh, the behavior of cats or the uh, the how the cats are made up of? He, it is not possible. He did not learn that. He learned only coding. So he has to depend on someone else to do this work. Okay, provide the information. Now, after all this, if there is a new cat, new breed of cat which is smaller and the color is something different again again he has to reprogram something could go wrong again he has to reprogram okay now this task is an endless task it's uh, um this is the this is how machine learning works okay done now this is the challenge with the machine learning okay now what is a deep learning okay in deep learning, I don't have to type a code and say, look for pointed ears. But instead of that, in machine learning, I only show photos of cats, uh, thousands of cats, pictures of cats, different breeds, uh, different colors, different heights, size. I will show in front of the camera. I will show videos and photos and the camera starts to learn by itself. OK, who's doing this kind of uh, learning? Human beings. We do that way. That's why you see a brain for deep learning. For machine learning, you see a, a gear like a machine, like the old gearbox, right? So uh, this is machine learning. Deep learning is camera is training just like a human being. Of course, some assistance is required, just like when uh, let's say when we are a child, uh, your parents will tell you, hey, this is a basketball and uh, this is a basketball. They keep telling you whenever you go play around, when you see with your friends, you learn by yourself. Nobody programmed into you. you by looking and looking and looking, your brains develop neurons, which the more uh, you see, the more you witness you are able to uh, make better decisions okay more neurons you develop okay now when you look at that orange color ball automatically in your brain a lot of calculations are taking place immediately it sees okay it's not a square it's a spherical object okay it's it must be a ball then you look for the color okay it looks like a basketball then you see the lines and you see the patterns you know the dot patterns the rugged design and you know how it feels like automatically all these thoughts come in your mind and then you come to a conclusion that this is a basketball right all this based on your experience in the last couple of years since your childhood that is deep learning OK, so today uh, in CCTV, uh, deep learning is the most important uh, reason why AI became famous. OK, overall, deep learning is the most important reason why AI became famous, because in uh, in deep learning, you don't have to depend on somebody. You can just uh, download data sets online of uh, humans and then upload and train the camera and the camera now knows who is a person. The person can be small, can be a child, can be a baby. It knows it's a person because it's trained. OK, got it. Now, where deep learning can be used, where machine learning can be used. Machine learning, you can use, people use it for a very controlled environment. You, let's say a factory. In a factory, they, want, they use a camera to check if the final product is in good condition, if it is broken or not. So they can, they know exactly the dimension of the object. The lighting inside the factory is uh, constant. The size of the object is constant. Everything is constant. It is fixed. So then you can program and say, look for this ABC. It's OK. There you can use machine learning. But in a CCTV environment, so if you take an environment like this in a CCTV, it's an outdoor scene. The light keeps on changing. There is shadows, lots of people walking, different heights of people walking, different. If you take a road, different types of uh, cars are moving in the road. It is not possible to do machine learning here. Forever you have to keep on programming. OK, so deep learning 
um, is the way to go okay then here uh, another challenge with machine learning is if the car is behind the tree if a person is hiding behind a, a tree or if a person is crawling so here the person is not facing the camera and uh, you're only seeing the back and uh, let's say if he's crawling is not walking is crawling now maybe you programmed and you said the person should be at least 1.6 meter height and you should have la uh, hands legs and so on but you never programmed that if a person is crawling uh, his height will be less right so the camera will forget and miss that okay if the person is hiding behind the tree only his face is visible maybe you programmed you should have hands now based on your programming there is no hands because he's hiding behind the tree so it will miss so machine learning is not the way to go but please be careful today you can make any camera a machine learning camera okay and many brands are misusing this concept because if you use machine learning, you can still call it AI. It comes under the umbrella of AI. Okay? If you use deep learning, it comes under the umbrella of AI. Both the words come under the umbrella of AI. So if I use machine learning, I can say it's an AI camera. If I use deep learning, I can say it is AI camera. Okay. So uh, good vendors don't use this. Uh, I've seen now there were some good vendors who started with machine learning, but they have they've completely stopped probably it backfired and they've changed to deep learning only okay so uh, okay if you ask me yes we use deep learning for all our cameras because that's the essence of ai not machine learning okay okay now technically deep learning is one part of machine learning okay so that is uh, getting way too deep into this concept so i don't want to go there but hope you got the idea what is relevant in cctv how people are vendor specify in cctv okay outside cctv they may use slightly differently but inside cctv a machine learning camera is different from a deep learning camera because the processor used in a machine learning camera is a very basic the processor used in deep learning is a high-end processor it's a more powerful processor because it has to make a lot of decisions it has to learn and all this learning is not done by you it is done by the vendor itself because you cannot uh, download 10,000 pictures of human beings and uh, do this work right it has to be done by somebody so we do this learning for you we upload it in the camera firmware and all you have to do is just uh, use the camera when you purchase a camera it comes preloaded and uh, the uh, firmware or the file this learning algorithm is constantly updated by the vendor on a yearly basis or a, a half yearly basis okay now let me tell you why do you need this in cctv before artificial intelligence analytics came we used something called pixel based analytics what is pixel based analytics okay look at the left side picture of the video there is a uh, multiple objects moving two people walking and the robotic arm is also moving all right so both of these are moving objects and both of them according to the camera is causing motion okay so any change in the pixel you know uh, pixel inside i mean the i mean the image is made up of 1000 pixels and 2000 pixels right so if any changes in the pixel it triggers a motion okay that is pixel based motion however if you use ai it doesn't it is trained to detect only a person so even if the robotic arm is moving it is ignored it will reject it and only focus on the person okay so it puts a bounding box look for the person on the face and triggers an alarm a normal pixel based analytics may even consider this as one big person because they are standing very close, so it might think it's a big person. But AI will consider two persons separately because of its deep learning capacity. Okay, there is one more uh, benefit. Let me show that.
rain. A camera, uh, usually when it is raining, a normal camera will pick up alarm because you see the water droplets are so big that the camera thinks it's a big object intruding the scene. Okay, whereas in uh, AI camera, it doesn't matter. Uh, clouds, shadows, not affected. Rain, not affected. It only looks for person and picks it up. So if you go back to this PowerPoint and if you look here, you can see the camera is picking up a car. Even behind the tree, there is a person standing in the office building. It picks up everything and detects everything. There is a person, there is a car. It picks it up. Only those objects. Now the application is endless. There is no end to how you want to apply this. We will see that after our break.
Okay, welcome back. Let's see how AI analytics deep learning can be used in a variety of ways. Okay, starting with Okay, so let's say you're looking for different types of intrusion in an area. The camera is looking at this big uh, office uh, outdoor area or a mall outdoor area. And uh, let's say they don't want anyone waiting. So there is a cash guy, Nissan cash guy here waiting um, for over five minutes. Okay but it is a vehicle so you can trigger and say or you can put a command in the camera and say if it is a car which has been waiting for over five minutes i need an alarm or if it is a truck okay maybe it is unloading up to 15 minutes okay that can be done next if this is a sensitive area you can draw a line or a zone across this entire property no and say no trucks allowed so you can mark truck immediately and you can not for not just for this you can say immediately i need an alarm if there is a truck entering the property i need an alarm so we or you can train the camera or not you as in the vendor will train the camera and keep it ready you can use as you like detect a car detect a truck detect a bus motorcycle and uh, some of them can detect um, person with gender so here this is an example person vehicle different types of vehicle category crossing so you can the application is endless and it is up to how you want it okay another example would be yeah, around the perimeter you can draw a zone you can draw multiple zones and you can say loitering for a certain time and it knows exactly how the person looks like or you can say this is a park and only people are supposed to walk in it's a pedestrian area but if you have motorcycles and bicycles and causing disturbance you can trigger an alarm or if there is an yellow line and if a car is crossing trigger an alarm or if this is a highway if a person is crossing the street is not allowed to cross you can trigger an alarm so all this you can use it for your purpose on the here there is a car parked in the bus stop for more than five minutes or two minutes you can trigger an alarm okay now if you didn't have ai and uh, if you had just a normal camera pixel detection uh, in the pixel you cannot train the camera for a car it is only pixel the maximum that you can do for a older generation camera is you can put the size of the object you can say uh, detect any object which is two meter wide okay you will put a object size you will calibrate and you say two meter wide object maybe it is a car but there is a problem if there are five people standing next to each other according to the old generation camera pixel based analytics it will think it's a it's a car because there are five people standing next to each other so deep learning is not affected by those kind of issues deep learning knows what's a car and what's not a car what's a person what's not a person and why we train the cameras for person and car is because any kind of intrusion is usually occurred by these two objects person driving a car or a person in the property and uh, hopefully maybe we will also add a drone because that is also com not very common but still at some some sensitive areas there is a drone detection also may be required okay then you can put a draw line and say if a car is going inside the parking lot no problem but a person is crossing after night time you need an alarm you can do that uh, maybe he's going inside hiding somewhere doing something else you can get an alarm um, then uh, you can also count uh, vehicles so you can just count as you like type of vehicles so all this is now possible with what artificial intelligence in the camera itself no extra licenses it's all there already included inside the camera
then what else can you do? Uh, you could also have a, a direction. So you draw a line and you say, if any vehicle is going in the opposite direction, someone taking a reverse, I need an alarm. Or if the time between the vehicle crossing the two lines is taking a long time, that means there is a traffic jam. So I want an alarm. So you can train the camera as you like. There is also a requirement for training the camera for uh, falling. If a person falls, I want an alarm. So that can be done. Then when you do a search, let's say I am looking for a car, missing car. Uh, sorry, I'm looking for a person, a suspect wearing a red shirt. You can also search in the VMS can be our VMS or it can be a third party VMS because it's all in the camera. So the camera, if you connect to any VMS that is integrated, you can do this. You can search even through an open standard on these analytics can be injected. So we will see that in today. Um, so yeah, you can search for a person and you can say I'm looking for a male. I am looking for a red shirt and carrying a bag, wearing a glass. Um, or if you're looking for a certain age group, you can search all these kind of criteria and speed up your response. You can search for a black color car. You can say I'm looking for a car, not a truck, which is black color. And you can click and get a video on the right side. Or you can search for a missing child and so on. Okay, so all of this is now possible uh, with your analytics on the camera and you can use with recorders or VMS of your choice. Then comes dashboards for counting and uh, dashboards for your system health. All that can be done. OK, it doesn't limit here. There are plenty of developers in the market. They can also develop applications for the camera and insert the application for fire detection, smoke detection. Uh, there are some very funny requirements we have received also counting sheep, counting cattle. So all this also can be done in one of the ports we supplied for counting uh, import of sheep and so on. So you can train the camera as you like and uh, you can use it for your application. And what's the benefit? The same camera looking at the uh, mon area for monitoring the street, for monitoring if uh, the entrances can count, can detect if person is falling or can do other things just like a real person, real security officer in that area. Okay. All right. Yes, you can count number of persons uh, as well. So let me uh, show you this one. So you put the mark, the direction. So in is count in, out will detect automatically. So same line can do in and out counting and queue management also you can do heat mapping you can do. Okay, just an example for you to keep in mind. So do not limit the application of AI to what you see alone, but it can do much more than that. Okay. Next is ONWIF standard. What is ONWIF? It is an open standard. Some of you come from electrical background, mechanical background. In your system, there will be some kind of open standard. BACnet uh, is an open standard. Lawn networks is an open standard. Uh, and uh, KNX protocol. Um, so these are some of the protocols. TCP IP is an open standard, right? Uh, open pro I mean, it's a common standard. Same way in CCTV, if you want to interconnect different brands of cameras with different brand of VMS, there is a common language. Just like you come from different region, you're attending a session and I'm speaking in English. So the common language is English for us. So we can understand each other, although we come from different countries. Same way for the camera, OnWIF is your common language. Open network video interface forum. That is a full form. Full form is not at all important. What is important is on with the short form. That is what is commonly understood. Okay, on with is not uh, is not uh, is not a government body. It is a group of vendors, uh, leading vendors in the market. OK, 
okay they came together and they developed a standard so every camera is running an open standard called on with standard okay so i can use uh, my camera with uh, another vms company which supports on with and i they can use uh, any cameras which supports vm on with standard okay and same for me if my vms can accept any cameras from different brand which supports on with okay there are different uh, standards or revisions under on with the basic one is on with s and the most important one is on with s okay one more point on with g q t which are released there are additional standards it does not replace the other one so if your camera supports uh, on with G, it should also support on with S. S is your basic. Why basic? When you connect a camera, what is the basic thing that we need? A video. If it has audio, okay, audio. If it is a PTC camera, I can zoom in, zoom out. I need to control the lens. These are basic features. So that is on with S. On with G, Q, T, added H.265. H.265 was not required in S. So, um, if a VMS supports on with S only, maybe H.265 cameras will not connect. So, that is not a criteria for that time. So, H.265 recommend, I mean, as a mandatory to be added was in 2017. But today, with so many analytics, on with released one more standard called on with M. So any software company which supports on with M, uh, I mean, which developed their analytics based on on with M can speak to any brand of cameras, can inject their analytics on any brand of cameras on the camera itself. There is an additional uh, memory available to install third party applications to do extra analytics like mask detection. Even we have it as a built in, but uh, some people add their own mask detection application. Uh, sheep counting was an external application which can be installed. So all these can be added on to the camera. Okay, how to check? You go to onwith.org, okay? Whenever you buy any camera, make sure at least it supports onwith because in the future, maybe you don't like the recording server, you want to change it, you can change. You can uh, buy someone else. You don't have to replace the camera. Okay. So uh, yeah. So here, go to onwith.org, and once you log in, click on the right conformant products, compliant products, and under this, you can search for your specific uh, model number or specific brand. You can search for there. There are around 19,000 products listed, okay? But surprisingly, there are some small brands you don't even know. They are uh, they are available, you know. Uh, they are saying they're on with, but they will not be listed. So just be careful. Uh, some cameras they may mention on the data sheet, but it will not be listed here. Okay, cyber security. Uh, cyber security is uh, simply making sure your camera is protected not only with uh, uh, not only with one single step. Okay, there's no single button called protect my camera. It's there are different methods or different steps you have to take. Uh, and I always take an example of your house and. Uh, Okay, when you um, when you lock your house at night, you lock the main door, you close the windows. So you have different ways to lock you open, close the gate. So many things you do, right? Same way for the camera, there are many ways to protect the camera. But the good thing is the vendor by default will activate all these settings. Okay, that settings that said there is a mm, vendor has the responsibility to do this. Uh, somehow, and that is uh, coming under a third party certification called 
secure by default certification so here secure by default that means by default the vendor will activate all the security features to make sure that the camera is safe okay so that is secure by default certification then comes backdoor what are the different ways uh, uh, people uh, misuse is uh, backdoor okay backdoor what is backdoor a, a, when you log into a camera you go to the main ip address put your username and password that is the front door okay but if you do use any other special codes special uh, url special programming codes to enter the camera that is a backdoor okay okay some vendors used to have backdoors uh, but most of them have removed it but uh, yeah so that is one that is one way of people used to hack then weak password policy. I've seen vendors using allowing password as just as simple as one letter, just one letter. So there was a company which I, it's actually a European company. I, the password was just letter A, it accepted. So that is not, uh, that is a weak password concept, okay? So anybody can use brute force attack and get it, get access to the camera. So strong password, the stronger the password, the more difficult it becomes to log into the camera. Okay, so uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. here we go. This is an example. How long does it take? Four letters, five letters, six letters, time to crack or hack or brute force attack. The more you increase the number of letters, the more difficult it becomes to um, attack and guess the password with the software. More complexity and more length increases the uh, ruggedness of your password okay i hope you, that is clear so many vendors now enforce it they enforce and they ask you to put a strong complex password it we for example i will take our example we say minimum eight let characters and uh, we don't allow three consecutive letters we don't allow three consecutive numbers it should and you should have minimum one capital letter you should have minimum one uh, one small letter you should have minimum one number and one special character so it has to be a complex password okay now oh, sorry why did i go here let me go to the slide defense in depth Okay, so when you uh, protect your camera, there are different ways you can protect. First one is of course strong password and you can keep the camera separate from other, uh, separated from other systems. Uh, you keep the camera updated, keep the softwares updated. Then uh, just like you close the windows in the camera, I mean, in your house, you close the windows so someone does not get in through the window. That is called, uh, in the camera, there are ports available. Okay, what is ports? Uh, in order to understand this better, a camera sends video, sends audio. You can access the web page, you can log in. So, so many communication happens with the camera, video communication, audio communication, text data communication, metadata, analytic data, so many communications are happening. Okay, so think of this as a highway. Okay, there are thousands of cars on the highway, but they're able to pass through because each of them have a lane and every car has to go behind another car. Same way in a camera, there are different ports open uh, ports available you have to communicate through that particular port like gate gate number one gate number two gate number one for this data uh, gate number two only for audios like that so there are ports available and they have numbers port number 80 port number 50 port number 60 so on okay whichever ports are not used close it the camera you can close those ports there are 60,000 plus ports available for each purpose and the vendor will close all the ports which is not used, okay? So that is one. Then there is a software running in the camera. There's a small database where all the passwords are stored. It has to be encrypted. Firmware encryption is required. You, if someone downloads the firmware and understands, okay, how the password is communicated, where it is saved, they can directly access that particular folder and try to get access. So all this helps to protect the camera. Then physically, you can keep the network switches, 
away from or securely logged in a rack. All these are basic uh, steps that you can take. So you would have seen in the PowerPoint there are many ways how you can protect the camera. Okay, great. Today, cybersecurity is a very dry topic, in my opinion, but uh, it's a very critical topic because when something goes wrong, then the whole world knows about it and every you spend a lot of money trying to fix it. And uh, response, they say prevention is better than cure. It applies very well when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, you might have heard of the word ransomware. Ransomware is someone hijacks your system and they lock it and you cannot use your own system unless you give them money. So a lot of incidents happen uh, where people give money and try to get the system back. And uh, if you don't, you have to uh, you have to again rebuild your system from scratch because you are locked out of your system. So uh, that is ransomware that is quite common. And that is one of the main reasons of hacking nowadays nowadays because it's an opportunity to make money okay next is a sec uh, nowadays uh, cyber security is also from the chipset level secure storage secure operating system so from the chipset if someone injected a malicious code the camera will not boot from the chipset the passwords are st saved in a secure environment which cannot be accessed by the by a user who logs in, he cannot access that area of the storage. It's like someone coming to my house. They don't have access to where I keep the safe or locker or where I keep the cash or so. Or someone accessing the bank, you're a customer to the bank, does not mean you can access every area in the bank. So same way in the camera, there's a separate storage memory for the passwords, encryption keys, and there is a separate operating system for processing the password. That is all now possible at the chipset level. So we as vendor, we have <coughs> developed it. Many vendors have started adopting this method. Okay. Okay. To uh, to certify this cyber security, third party vendors, third party certification bodies have come in, like UL. They supply UL CAP certification. UK they have secure by default certification, so the vendor will apply all the secure settings by default and ship it to you. Then uh, secure UART means if you give the camera for servicing, the service port also can only be opened by a secure operator, secure by the authorized. Uh, you know, repair person. So that also can be secured. Then uh, today we have a, a TPM chip. This is something that you will you would have heard. Whenever you install Windows 11, some laptops are not compatible. Why? Because it requires a TPM, Trusted Platform Module chip. It's like it's like a fingerprint data for your computers. So that also is available now in certain models of cameras. Um, for defense projects, for government projects. So if someone takes some component of the camera, they cannot uh, recover the data. It is only attached to that particular camera. It's like bit locker for your laptops. Okay, so something like that. Uh, so that is also available in the CCTV system. Okay, now let's have a look at recorders. If there are any further questions, please post in the Q&A section. Recording. Recording is done uh, on uh, two ways. It depends on the project size and depending on the requirement. Network video recorder. NVR or video management system. We will see that step by step. Network video recorder. Okay. First, let's understand why a video recorder or is required or a video management system is required.
if I have only one camera, if I have just one camera with me, you don't need a VMS actually. You can directly see from the web page of the uh, camera. So you can directly see what's from the camera, uh, video from the camera. You can record on the SD card of the camera or you can record on your PC. But when you have more than five cameras, 10 cameras, when, simply when you have more than two cameras itself, then it becomes difficult for you to start managing. So let's say here, I have now four cameras. I cannot open multiple web page one by one and try to log in every time and check the live view and playback. I want to centralize. Password, okay, yeah. So when I have more than one camera, it is better for me to have one central. Um, that's me. Okay, you, it's better for you to have one central interface to see all the cameras together in one location. Okay, so that's where the NVR concept started. Okay, now looking at an NVR, let's say XRN6410, just for an example, um, what is it? Okay, it's like a small computer, or you can call it a mini server. Inside the uh, server, it there is a software already installed where you can add all the cameras. You can live view, playback, export. You can uh, manage all the passwords of all the cameras, everything in one device. Okay, think of it this way. You log into the NVR, then you have access to all 64 cameras. You don't have to log in separately to 64 cameras to see the video. Now you got the idea. It's like you in your iPhone, you have Face ID. When you have Face ID, you can log into all your applications in your phone using Face ID. Although this application is from a different banks, it could be from different uh, um, third-party application. This doesn't matter. If you have access to the phone, you have access to the email, you have access to the credit cards and everything. Same way, you can now use, consider this NVR as your central device, which will record all the cameras. It is designed for 64, so 64 camera, and it can record them. It has monitor output behind it. So if you look behind, there is two HDMI outputs. You can directly monitor all 64 camera together in one monitor, you can do that. You can export the video, you can connect your monitor, plug your USB, export the video, or go to the web page of the NVR and export the video. Let me see if I have one recorder here. Okay, so this is the web page of uh, NVR. I can see multiple cameras together. So all these cameras I can see in one screen and I can create multiple layouts and so on and get my access to my video. I can play back here. I can play back the video. I can export, I can export to USB or through my, to my laptop or my system. I can search for AI, artificial intelligence, person wearing mail, which color. If you have AI camera, you can do that and you can add your camera 64 cameras, right? You can click auto detect. It will detect all the cameras in your network and you can choose which cameras you want to add, which 64 cameras you want to add. Okay, so you can select, I want to add all these cameras. You apply, it gets added. You can give names to the camera. You can edit the names. You can say, I want to record, uh, I want to record H.265. Um, so you can customize all this from one location. You don't have to do it one by one. You can say, I want to record all cameras, H.265, done. Then uh, when you want to record uh, daytime, I want to record continuously. Uh, you can say from morning eight o'clock till seven o'clock, I want to record continuously. Then in the evening, I will record only if there is motion. And you can customize this for each channel, channel by channel. 
and you can or you do one and apply to all channels. So you get the idea. This is an NVR which allows you to manage centrally for a group of cameras. Okay. Then of course you can see events if you see, if you get an event. Let's say if I receive a motion detection on this camera, I want to take action, start recording, send email, get push notification, etc., etc. You can create multiple rules. You can add on with camera to the NVR. Then uh, you can manage the. Okay, there's one more point. This particular NVR supports 16 hard disk. So if you have 64 camera, you need to record a lot of data. So you can insert hard disk and you can also manage all 16 hard disk. Okay, so it supports 16 slots and you can manage RAID, RAID 5, RAID 6. We will see that later on about RAID. So you can manage them. Okay, then you can customize the networking. Uh, there are multiple network ports. One port you can keep for camera recording, the other port for custom live viewing, or you can connect to your office network for viewing. These are all security features. IP filtering, HTTPS 802.1.x. Uh, you can manage the date and time of your recorders. You can keep a backup. You can update your recorders. So simply put, you have one central device now doing all this function. This device itself I'm accessing from the web page or I can directly plug a monitor behind it and get access to the NVR. It will look the same, just like how you see on the web page. Even if you connect your monitor, it will look the same. Okay. Now two monitors you connected. Got it done. So this is recording our recorders. Now the benefit of buying NVR is it is all pre-installed. The software is pre-installed. You don't have to check which HDMI card will work, which graphics card will work, which network card will work, which Windows operating system I need to install. All this headache is eliminated when you look for NVR solution. So when your projects are small, medium scale, you don't want to take the headache of uh, finding out which recorder is suitable, all that. Directly you can look for NVRs, they come from 16 channel, 32 channel, 8 channel, even 4 channel is available. And uh, if you look behind, some of them even have directly, you can connect the IP camera. So if you see here, there are 8 ports behind the camera with a PoE. Directly, if you connect your camera behind the NVR, it will get power for the camera also. It will supply PoE power to the camera as well. So very good. You don't have to, you don't need a network switch. You can manage all the cameras from the device. Okay, so now that is your NVR concept. Okay, usually recorders running on Linux, but you can monitor from your Windows PC. Okay. Then today projects are becoming larger and larger. Today, Windows also become, it's become more stable comparative to many years back. So there is a shift in the VMS segment. There is a shift in the CCTV. More and more recording softwares are now available as a Windows application, okay? One of the main reason was, what if you have more than 64 camera? You need two NVR, okay? So that means you have to log in separately to each NVRs. Okay, what if you have five NVRs? You need to log in separately to five NVR. And how to link, let's say an alarm occurred in NVR one, I want to trigger recording of another camera in NVR two, not possible. Okay, what if, what if I want to see all the entrance cameras, but the entrance camera, half of them is in NVR two. I want to see in one window, how to do it. Currently, if you have just one NVR, not possible. So what to do, you need a VMS. VMS is a upper layer which can connect to multiple NVRs under one software. A video management system can handle multiple NVRs. If you don't have NVRs, no problem. The VMS can also uh, directly connect to the cameras and 
connect to third party rec or additional recording servers and do recording. Okay, well, I'll come to that step by step. Okay, so VMS, if you have NVRs, can be used to manage multiple NVRs from one central location. What is the benefit? If I log into my VMS, um, let's say I buy a video management system and uh, I add all the NVRs to my VMS, simple, I can now access. If I log in once, I have access to all my NVRs. If I log in once, I can have access to all the recording playback for all the cameras across all the NVRs, okay? I will take an example of Hanwha VMS. If you use our VMS, okay, you can one, you buy one PC, install SSM VMS, you buy our VMS, install it. You can connect around three, up to 40 to 50 NVRs or 3000 cameras through NVRs, you can connect directly to the VMS and you can expand to 6000, 9000, 10,000. You can expand. Uh, that is part of system design. I don't want to go there to this course. Just want to give you an idea. A VMS can be a upper layer where all the NVRs can connect. Okay. Some vendors are providing this free of cost because you're already buying their NVR. Okay. Some of them, no, they will charge you licenses for it. But the function is the same. Just because it is having license doesn't make it extra. Uh, extra because anyway you're going to see the cameras which you already purchased the recording which you already purchased so that way now you're not going to get anything extra so you decide and find which is the most efficient option for you maybe that vms has some extra feature maybe some extra integration with some third party or some unique feature which is not available then you can pay for it but generally speaking most companies that make NVRs, they have a viewing software or a VMS software where you can centrally manage all the NVRs. Take it as your first option. Okay, then if you're not buying, let's say, let's say each NVR here can only handle 64 camera. That's too less in current scenario. Okay, I have two questions. Can we connect uh, external storage to NVR? Yes, you can expand. If 16 hard disks is not enough, you can expand the NVR storage, make it ex add external storage, make it 180 days recording, it's possible. Uh, ARB is part of a product feature, but I will just explain. Uh, in NVR, there is a feature where if your camera is recording on the SD card, as well as on the NVR, camera is recording on the SD card, as well as on the NVR and in some, maybe if the disconnection, if there is a disconnection between camera and NVR, the NVR uh, stops recording, let's say for one day, maybe some issues, the network. So the camera is still recording on the SD card, all right? Now, once the connection is restored, once the connection is restored, all the data in the SD card can be transferred back to the NVR. Okay, so that feature is available. We call it uh, we call it ARB feature, but so someone asked about it, so I'm explaining that. But yeah, that feature is available uh, in many NVRs are available as well. Okay, now back to VMS. What if you have more than 64 cameras, 65? So you need to buy one more NVR. So there is some downside. What if you don't like this recording server? It is Linux based. So what if you don't like it? You have to throw it. Okay, so in this case, the, if you need flexibility, open plat, open uh, source and all that uh, extra words that you hear um, about uh, larger systems, okay? One of the main reason is, let's say if you need, if your project have thousand cameras, how many NVRs do you need? Close, more than 10 NVRs you need if you have thousand cameras. Okay, uh, why not make it efficient? Why not, can I, why not I'll buy my own server and increase the specification, uh, make it Xeon processor and make it 300 cameras? It is possible, okay? So how it is done is uh, today in a VMS system, okay, you can buy a server and install the recording application on it and that server you can specify with the high-end CPU and 
uh, then you high end ram or 16 gb 32 gb ram you can increase it and you can add up to 300 cameras so that is possible okay done okay there's one more point I wanted to mention. Uh, an NVR is an all-in-one device because behind the NVR, there is monitor output. Inside the NVR, there is hard disk. Inside the NVR, there is a database to manage 64 cameras. So all the three functions, it's an all-in-one device, okay? All your headache in one, all your requirement in one, okay? All the features in one. So when you have 64 camera, you don't have to buy a separate database PC. You don't have to buy separate hard disks PC, uh, recording server PC. You don't have to buy separate PC for connecting monitors. Everything in one, okay? So it's very cost effective. You will not believe the price. It's three times lesser than buying separate database, separate recording server, separate client. So NVR is still popular for smaller projects. Okay, okay, good point. What about redundancy? NVR also supports failover. NVR also supports um, multiple network ports. NVR supports multiple uh, redundant power supplies. So today, NVR is also surprisingly very, very good when it comes to redundancy. They have dual power supply, dual network cards, dual fans, uh, N plus one failover. Uh, they have a RAID 5 and RAID 6 redundancy in the hard disk, RAID 5, RAID 6. So it is quite a stable product. It is quite a rugged product. So we can see even in large projects, people use it. Okay, done. Now, uh, what is the thing with uh, VMS? VMS is splitting the application. Database by a separate PC. Recording by a separate PC. So you buy a dedicated server for recording, so you can go 300 cameras. You buy a dedicated server for database, okay, I can handle database of not just 64, I can handle database of 10,000 cameras. Okay, you buy a separate PC for client viewing station, why? Because behind the NVR only two monitor output is there. What if you need four monitors? How, it, how do you do that? So you can buy a separate client PC, you can put a graphics card and connect four monitors. So when you split the function, you call it enterprise VMS because each of the functions, you have a dedicated hardware associated, dedicated CPU uh, associated with it. So it increases the capacity of the device. Okay. So uh, simply let's compare NVR versus VMS. When you go with NVR, they are usually, they don't charge any camera licenses, okay? They have all the redundancy features, dual power supply and fans and all that. Um, display port is there, all that is there, okay, done. Okay, Windows. Today Windows is also st stable enough and uh, the benefit is you can put more cameras in one device. So if you have a thousand cameras and you have 300 cameras per server, only four servers you need. So footprint is less. And second point is it is um, best of breed, which means tomorrow if you don't like a particular recording software, you can uninstall and install something else. But if it is Linux based, it is embedded, that means uh, you have to throw it and you have to buy a new recording device. So that is a benefit of Windows. You know, in your laptop, you install a software, you uninstall it. Same thing you can do with your VMS. You don't like some company, VMS company, you can uninstall and reuse the same hardware for someone else. Okay, so you don't have to throw that hardware. Okay, and also in terms of uh, product features and uh, newer developments, Windows, VMS, are much more faster, more features are released often in Windows-based VMS, okay. And uh, price-wise, they are two to three times more. So you have to decide your project, 500 camera, 600 camera, and it's, you can use NVRs, but when you have large projects, 1,000, 2,000 cameras, try to deviate towards Windows-based recording systems, uh, because it's, they come in a much more higher capacity. 
So in the long term, maintenance cost, uh, management cost, everything will reduce. And also the system cost will reduce when you start to increase because for 1000 camera, you need 12, 14, 16, around that many NVRs. We can let's calculate quickly. Thousand divided by sixty-four. You need fifteen, sixteen NVR, but if you use three hundred camera server, you need uh, only four. So your price will reduce when your number of servers increase, uh, number of I mean number of cameras increase in a large way. Windows based will be more cheaper than Linux, so that also can occur. Okay. All right, so there is a question on, can I use the client PC for uh, some other purpose other than CCTV? Um, I, uh, not recommended. If it is uh, for, if you, if it is consuming the CPU, if it is consuming the RAM, uh, then you have to increase. So let's say I want to use my client PC for access control and the CCTV. Okay. As a client application for CCTV will take the most RAM and CPU because you're decoding the video. But if you want to use it for access control as a client, um, you can use it. So you can increase your CPU, maybe increase more cores, increase a bit of RAM. Usually access control PCs require very little RAM. So you can do that. Or if you're running a small web page application, it is okay. Uh, but the challenge is the network port. Sometimes both of them are trying to communicate in the same network port, port number, so it causes confusion. So try to keep it separately for the server side. As the client side, you can consider to keep in the same PC. Okay, next. Can the client PC be located anywhere else? Yes, the client PC can be located wherever it is on the network. It is completely fine. Even remotely, it is also completely fine. Over the internet, also there are options to view your site. Uh, what are the maximum recording? I mean, how many cameras can be recorded on one server? Is it 300? Uh, there are 300 cameras server. There is 360 camera server. I have seen even 1000 camera servers from third party. So all of this is available, but uh, try to also use your security mindset. If one server is dead, all thousand cameras is gone. So don't design a project with a thousand camera per server or 500 camera per server, because you're also increasing a risk factor. Okay, of course there is failover, but inside this there is hard disk. So you will lose that much of data if something catastrophic happens. So try to keep a good number. 200, 300, that is somewhat acceptable, or uh, 250, uh, but don't go all the way to 500 because you're increasing your uh, disaster risk, okay? Okay, so uh, okay, the final topic for today is uh, just one slide: uh, DAS NASAN. Um, very simple. DAS. These are different types of storage used for recording in CCTV direct attached storage. If your hard disk is directly attached to a recorder, and if inside the recorder there is directly attached storage, DAS. In your laptop, there is one hard disk, DAS. In your CPU, there is one or two hard disk, DAS. Directly attached storage. NAS, over the network. The hard disks are connected over the network. The file format is a network file format. Okay, and it depends on the network as well because you are transferring the data over the network. Okay, next, SAN. SAN is, uh, uh, is, is a 
is a better way of DAS. Okay. Uh, thing is, for example, in my server or in my laptop, okay, let's say I have this NVR. Okay, I have this recorder, 300, I mean, 16 hard disk. Uh, and we clearly know DAS is super fast because it's directly attached, right? When you transfer your file within your laptop, it's much faster than transferring your file over a USB or external hard disk. Okay, think of that as NAS. But if you want in your laptop to have the same transfer speed, but it should be on the network. Okay, storage area network is similar to DAS, but it's on the network side. How is it fast? Because they use fiber connection. Fiber connection for higher speeds. And it simulates as if these hard disks are directly connected to your laptop or your server. Okay, so it is. So when you transfer to SAN, you feel like you're transferring to your local drive. And when you attach a SAN drive to your server, it is also attached like a C, D drive, E drive as a local drive. Okay, so SAN is a storage area network. It's a group of hard disks connected by fiber to your recording servers or to your, let's say your system, if you are using as an IT system to your laptops. Okay. Yes, they are expensive. But why do you need to use SAN? Let's say, let's say you have 2000 cameras in the project or 5000 cameras in the project. How many servers are you going to manage centrally? Are you going to put hard disk in each server for 5000 cameras? No, what if, uh, how you cannot, uh, if one hard disk fails, you, you, you will have to go to each uh, server and manually check uh, which hard disk or of course in the web page you can check and take it out and maintain. Okay, so over a long period of time, it becomes very difficult. So what you do is uh, you buy server only, but the storage you will use SAN because it is as if you're locally attached. Okay, it gives you the same performance, but all the storage you will have as a separate storage network or you will buy SAN storage. Uh, maybe you can see online. These are storage servers. So what you do is you have a separate device only for storage. So these come with a lot of features, hot swappable, uh, hot spare. If any hard disk fails automatically, the spare standby will take over. A single power, I mean, a redundant power supply, one central power supply option for all of this, one place to manage all the storage. And uh, uh, all the servers will be connected to this bunch of hard disks here, okay, sharing this storage source. So it becomes a much more, you see here, uh, there is one schematic, cameras, uh, okay, um, uh, recording servers, and only one, you don't see multiple storage, but you see multiple recording servers, but one storage unit, okay? So when you have too many cameras, it is better to have one central management for all the storage. That's where SAN comes in the picture. So that's all for uh, uh, today, if you have any further questions, please post in the chat window and uh, please expect an email from me for the quiz link and we'll take it from there. Tomorrow is the last day. I will be covering the VMS uh, raid and all the networking uh, topics which we did not, which we are yet to cover, which that will be covered as well for tomorrow. Second part, PPM, we covered pixel per meter. Some country, especially Dubai alone, speaks about body representation. Body representation. Body representation is percentage. Percentage has nothing to do with pixels. You can use a half megapixel camera, you can use 30 megapixel camera, does not matter. It only looks for body representation, okay? Both are actually separate from each other. They may put within bracket this equal to this, only the meaning wise they are same, but the consideration is completely different. Body representation 
criteria was there since the beginning of CCTV when they used this method because back then there was no megapixel camera. But when megapixel camera came, body representation became invalid. Okay, uh, what is this body representation? Okay, uh, right now, if you want to learn this, temporarily forget about megapixel, only then you can understand. Okay, temporarily forget there is a megapixel camera. Okay, imagine you have a basic half megapixel camera, just a basic four SIF analog camera, all right? Now, if you have such a camera, now I want to detect. As a operator sitting in the control room, I want to detect a person. How will you define a detection uh, criteria for that situation? Forget megapixel, forget pixels. Okay, so the standard back then was, if a person is 10%, 10, 10, 10 10% of the screen, your monitors, okay, you can detect a person detect there is a person. So imagine this is my full monitor. Okay, 10% of my screen height, there is a there is an object moving. As an operator, I can detect. If it is less than 10%, I may miss it. Okay, so that is the detection criteria. So if you put a, a camera in a corridor at 30 meters, if he's still 10% of the screen height, I can detect. If he's 50% of the screen height, I can recognize, okay, you see this guy here, 50% of the screen, 10% of the screen, detect something is moving, recognize. Then came 120%, how do you put 120% on a screen? Okay, a person head to feet is 100%, so more than 100% is 120, right? So head to feet is 100%. Okay, if you want 120%, you have to cut off his legs. So out of the screen, only from head till uh, his knee is 120%. Okay, if you cover head to feet in the screen, 100%. So if you cover head to knee, that is 120%. Okay. So here you can identify who the guy is, what his facial features, how he looks like. This is identification. Okay. Then came uh, the strong identification. There's something even more zoomed in. So when you do the traditional method in body representation, you cannot, uh, uh, you have to physically zoom the lens. You, you need more lens for 120% because it's not about megapixel anymore. You need to cover that much of the person, right? So you will, that's why you see in uh, CIRA requirement, five to 50 mm lens. Okay, for identification. Okay, now I know in some countries, especially in Saudi, they have put identification as thousand pixels. It is close to oh, virtually impossible to achieve that kind of uh, pixels. You can only do either this or that. Okay, uh, you cannot get a thousand pixels, and uh, it is more than two hundred percent. So you need to find a can, produce, make a camera for that to get 1000 pixels. That means you will be covering very small area. So it's a very, very high end requirement. From what I know, it is uh, mentioned there, but it is not strictly followed because it is practically or pragmatically difficult. So follow what is the international standard identification, 120 percent, 250 pixel, strong identification, 200 percent, 500 pixels. This is the EN standard or there is one more. So you, you follow only the standard that works. No, we are, you know, we are not considering strong identification.
Okay, I think some of you are having issues with a uh, quiz link. Let me find a way to because even after emailing it, you're saying you have not received it. So because I am uh, manually, I open the registration. Um, from the go to webinar and I send the quiz link. So I'm going to do uh, tomorrow after we finish the fourth day, I'm going to send all the quiz link together as one shot. I don't want to spam you with too many mails. So tomorrow after we finish, I will send all the quiz links to everyone. Um, you attend or not attend, I will send it. But when we issue the certificate, please note we do check the attendance because that is the mandatory requirement by Big Six. So we will check that attendance. Quiz is a secondary requirement. So primarily we will check the attendance. How can we identify the number of recording server and storage required? It is dependent on each vendor. So for us, if, if I take our example, we have servers with 360 camera support. So in that case, you take the number of camera divided by 360, that many servers are required. Uh, storage. Uh, storage, we will use the vendor calculator, like for us, Wisner Toolbox. Or if you're a consultant, you don't want to specify any brand for now, you go with the open source calculators get a ballpark figure so it can be done that way uh, so if you want to know exactly we have to attend pre-sales training of our product and we will teach you how to do it with our product 